Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to chat tonight about the economy, about the markets, about real estate, etc., with Martin Pelche. He is a senior uh, portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. Uh, he uh, posts uh, fairly frequently in the Financial Post. Um, and I read one article, uh, Martin, that you uh, that you wrote uh, recently that was about the real estate uh, markets that went viral. And you've got, what would you say, 5 million hits? Yeah, <laughs> the first go around, the second to go around, another million. So certainly getting a lot of attention. And a lot of that attention was south of the border. They were quite shocked to see the disparity between Canada and the U.S. Tell me what, what your uh, argument was, if you could. Well, I just took a look at affordability, and it, it plotted the housing prices against disposable income in uh, in Canada versus the U.S., and we're seeing things that, that would make the 2008 financial uh, crisis look like uh, a, walk, a walk in the woods. It's, it, it's the, the, the amount of housing speculation and growth in certain areas of the country is just astounding, uh, especially given the level of affordability. And, and I think this is an issue that is going to get more and more attention, especially as interest rates continue to move higher. And so what, uh, you're suggesting that we're in a bubble and we have a, a crash coming or what? Well, I, I, bubble, I, I'm very careful at using the term bubble. But when you look at, again, levels of affordability, and a good example is if you bought a house for uh, at prior to the, the rate hikes in Canada for $800,000, um, assuming you could buy something for $800,000, that means you're outside of, of the prairies, that's for sure. And... You know, your debt servicing costs and your mortgage, you'd be $2,500 a month. And, and if you wanted to maintain that $2,500 a month with new interest rates, the housing price would have to fall to about just under 500000 so 480000 to be precise. So that's a 40% drop in, in the asset price. Is Are we going to get there? Well, you know, we had a huge rally in, in housing prices last year, and now we're giving that back again. But do we continue is the big question. Do we fall back to where we were a couple of years ago? And I think, yeah, I think probably if, if interest rates keep going higher and mortgage rates keep going higher, we could we could see some some further further drops, 20 to 30 percent more in, in certain areas. And is that a bubble? Well, <laughs> it's certainly a correction. That's for sure. So uh, sales in the greater Toronto area are down something like 47%, uh, but prices are down by single digits. What does that mean? Well, it just means I, I liken it to a tsunami when the wave goes out and everybody's standing on the beach wondering what's going on. They're, they're just people, when when panic starts, before panic starts to set in and, and there's a lot of disbelief about rising rates and a lot of people don't actually know that much about it, but it's starting to 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 work its way in. So if you look at shelter costs as a um, in regards to its contribution to to inflation CPI, it's quite large at forty percent. But the data lags about eight to nine months, and the reason why that happens is it just takes it takes a while to work its way into um, into people's behavior, and so they're not selling. They're just saying, "I'm just going to hold tight." If you look at number of listings, I think it's at record lows. Um, it is in Calgary, and I've read it's similar in Toronto. And people say, I'm just not going to sell. I'll wait till, till spring when interest rates start to fall back again, and we go back to where it was before. And and then we get to you know March, closer to spring. Well, maybe in Toronto, but not in Calgary. Um, and then and then people say, Oh my goodness, rates haven't fallen. I've got to get I've got to get off this property because I can't afford it. And uh, or I got to get off of these other properties because I can't carry it anymore and rents start to go down and everything starts to fall apart. So that that is the risk. And if you're in, in positioned for that, um, you know, I would just exercise some caution. That's all. Some people have spoken to said uh, that you may be right from your analytical standpoint, but there's not a trigger in Canada like there was in the United States in 2008. You don't have the subprime crisis and because we have recourse mortgages here versus the non-recourse mortgages that you have, not everywhere, but in most states in the United States, if you have an affordability issue in the United States, you can actually give back the keys 
and uh, walk away from your mortgage. That's almost impossible to do in uh, in Canada. That debt follows you. So tell me, do you think there's going to be triggering events? Well, yeah. Look at interest rates. I mean, if, if we go to five or six percent, and I mean that's a huge adjustment. I just gave you the sensitivity on on asset prices, on home prices, on how much they have to 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 fall to meet levels of affordability. I, I mean, it's just interest rates. It's that simple. And going, if if the Bank of Canada goes, I mean, they went 50 uh, last week, which was a mistake in my opinion. Um, and the, the the Fed went 75 basis points. And and, and the Bank of Canada is going to have to go 75 in the next meeting and in December. And and so rates are, are, are continuing to go higher. And sure, inflation is is going to get better. I certainly believe that and 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 am in that camp, but rates are going higher and that's going to have an impact. If you look at also the U.S., they do 30-year mortgages. Uh, we do mostly five and we have a lot of variables. So that's a big difference between us and the U.S. So we have greater sensitivity to uh, to those rates. We're chatting tonight with Martin Pelche. He is a senior portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. He's uh, someone that commentates on Bloomberg and in the Financial Post on a fairly regular basis. Uh, I've read a bunch of his uh, posts and articles recently. They're really quite interesting. Um, we're going to take a break and come back, and I'm going to ask him a little bit more about the economy. I'm going to ask him about the fiscal update. I'm going to ask him about Alberta versus Canada versus Ontario. Uh, this is going to be a good conversation tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us, Martin. Thanks, everybody else. Two minutes. We're going to be back. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Martin Pelche. He is a uh, senior portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. He uh, comments on Bloomberg and uh, writes in the Financial Post. Uh, he's uh, got a uh, certified financial analyst background and uh, economics and business. And, uh, and uh, you know, my gosh, you've got just an incredible uh, um, background. Where is Orbro University that you graduated from? Uh, it's just south of uh, Stockholm, Sweden. That must have been fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. The uh, the food, the smogers torta and the fish cake wasn't the best part, the highlights of the trip. But uh, the people are absolutely fantastic and uh, they're very warming and, 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 and certainly take you in. So that was a, a great experience. Fantastic. We've been talking a little bit about uh, the real estate market. Let's widen it to the markets uh, generally. You wrote um, a couple of uh, posts about market corrections or where returns are made. Tell me about uh, what what your thesis is there. So if you look at, there was JP Morgan did a really good piece on this. And they showed that if you miss the best days in the market, it will have a material impact on your portfolio's performance. And so what ha typically happens is human behavior can wreak havoc on a portfolio because we we'll end up doing something called loss of uh, aversion. So we sell during the market lows because we can't take the losses anymore because our portfolios are marked the market. And we open our statements and say, oh, my God, this is terrible. I can't take this. I'm going to sell it and buy a 4.5% GIC right now. On the other side, beginning of the year, uh, you have something called FOMO or fear of missing out and say, wow, markets were up 15% last year. Um, I want to get a piece of that. I can't believe I didn't do that. And and so they buy at the wrong time and they sell at the wrong time. So we try and avoid all of that through something called goals-based investing. So we just say, what kind of target return do you need to meet a certain financial objective to you and ignore what everybody else is doing? And then um, when you look at return per unit of risk, um, there are periods of time that you can get a higher level of return and lower levels of risk. And that is typically following a market correction. And we've had a large one, certainly in, in the equity markets and bond markets more particularly, because bonds have had its largest sell-off um, since the 1930s. And so there's a lot of opportunities out there for investors who are willing to take on a little bit of risk to meet their personal goals and objectives. You know, this analysis that you mentioned uh, with JP Morgan really is fascinating that you said that over a 20-year period, if you missed only 20 days, you cut your returns in half. But we're all not smart guys like you that are watching the markets on a day-in and day-out basis. How does the regular investor actually make sure that they hit those 20 good days out of 20 years? You have to stay invested. 
And so the it, the easiest, I mean, the most common thing for investment advisors, you know, just buy and hold and forget about things and you'll be just okay. Um, I, I'm, that's not something that I'm advocating. I'm advocating always, if you're going to pay an advisor or an investment professional portfolio manager to oversee your money, it's their job to try and find opportunities for you to meet your goals and objectives. And there are more opportunities in certain markets and less opportunities in, in other market environments. It doesn't mean that you have to go on the sidelines. You have to stay invested, um, but you can certainly manage downside risk uh, through tactical asset allocation and times to go on the defensive, like at the beginning of the year. And there's times to go on the offensive, like uh, like we think we are um, in the last couple of weeks. And so that's where the investment professional could come in and say, hey, we need to go a little bit more defensive. We need to go a little bit more offensive. And, uh, and, and that's you know given by their pulse of the market and their level of expertise. Now, it's interesting that you're suggesting that the real estate market has some downside risk, but in the regular stock market, you're saying that uh, there's an opportunity to, to invest and make money. Um, some people think the stock market is sort of is six months ahead of the rest of the economy. What do you think? Yeah. And so <clears throat> I, I, I look at your house, I look at real estate. I mean, there's an asset class and then there's, uh, your home <laughs> and, and, and your home, I mean, if you're buying a house to live in. I mean, that's a whole different story. Um, and you stay with that home for the longer term. It, it, it's, it's a quality of life. It's part of your lifestyle assets. Um, but when it comes to investing, there's a time to invest in the real estate market. There's REITs, for example, or private uh, private markets on the real estate side. And there's times not to in, uh, to invest in, in that particular sector. And so you can you have to, it's important to have the distinction between asset class and your home. <laughs> and and I'm looking at it from an asset class standpoint when I'm saying there's more downside. And, uh, and, 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 and that's simply because of rising interest rates. So there's something that we track called duration uh, management or duration risk. Duration risk is sensitivity to interest rates. And, and for example, this year, any sort of um, asset class that had a long duration did really bad uh, because interest rates rose so fast so quickly. Okay, so help me here. Um, REITs, public REITs, uh, have seemed to have uh, been impacted fairly quickly, almost as quickly as the stock market. While um, net asset values for private uh, sales of of houses or of other real estate classes uh, don't seem to have been impacted, how do I explain that? Well, one asset, one uh, of, of those is marked the market; the other one isn't. And so, um, you know, one is there's transparency on pricing, and there's an open market; they trade on an exchange, and so you can see exactly what the market is thinking about the forward look for that for real estate. Um, simply because they're selling off and there isn't a big demand for it. The other one is there's no transparency. There's no a market exchange. So the only way you know what your house is worth is when you go and list it. And and if it's not selling, you got to lower the price. And if it's still not selling, you have to lower it further. And so that's the difference between the two. And that's where I'm, um, I've been a little bit more vocal and I'll be writing about this. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's looking at the private debt markets and the private mortgage markets, the private real estate markets. Um, there's probably a lot of, uh, of risk in there that <clears throat> isn't being reflected in the asset values. And so if you have an ability to sell at the higher prices, um, absolutely, I would take advantage of it. Um, because when it does get marked the market, it won't be pretty, um, if this certainly trend continues to play out. You know, it's interesting, uh, as I take a look at different uh, comparable homes in uh, in Toronto versus, uh, you know, similar sized cities in the United States uh, or resort homes in uh, in the Muskokas versus similar places in the United States, Canada is a lot more expensive. Why is that? Well, there there are those making the claim about immigration and we're having a, a record amount of immigration, especially on a per capita basis compared to other jurisdictions. Um, and, and, and there is some substance to that. Obviously, we have a, a huge influx of, of people coming into the country and the lack of, of supply of, of houses or building new houses to meet said demand. Um, yeah, it does. You know, on the surface, it does 
does make some sense there. And and I'm a proponent of, of that policy because we need to have more people. We need to have more talented people. We need more people adding to the economy. Um, and uh, and, that, and that's that's fine. But the average, I looked at the average immigrant salary um, coming into the country is something like forty four thousand dollars. And so, if you're living in Vancouver, I think the average home price is forty times that and twenty times that in Toronto. So, um, it, are are they the ones causing these massive spikes in, in housing? Uh, you know, that's a little bit of a stretch in 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 my opinion. So, there's more to it than than just the immigration. Uh, standpoint so yeah i think it's uh lack of supply and that lack of supply comes from uh, government restrictions yeah there's there's some there's we could talk about uh, municipality planning um they're they're trying to encourage uh higher density so there's but people want to have single family houses they want to have two-story single family houses and and so the, the ability to have that within certain cities that are constrained, like Vancouver, for example, that can't build out, um, is creating a shortage of of supply for that kind of demand. Um, people don't when they come to Canada, they don't want to live in a European like type of of setup, uh, high density apartments, uh, townhouses. They want to have the the house and the picket fence in the yard, and you can't blame them. And so there just is a lack of availability of those types of houses. Whereas if you come to Calgary or Edmonton or other areas where um, uh, I, I don't know if I want to use a swear word on your show, but bald ass prairies. And, uh, and so there's a lot of, of room to, to, to build out in, in, into those areas. So that's why we haven't seen the same kind of appreciation. Now at the same time, there's rampant speculation. You have people with two or three or four different types of properties and flipping them and selling them. And that's the margin. And that's, that's the area that is, is creating a lot of concern in my opinion. So you think the flipping's going to, going to have some challenges and that's where people are going to have some losses. Yeah. What about um, sort of uh, migration? You know, Toronto had a huge migration out of Toronto into the suburbs, uh, uh, during the pandemic, as people uh, were working and uh, and living in 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 suburbs like uh, Brantford and Brampton and uh, and Barrie and and whatnot, uh, but Ontario had out migration for the first time in a long time, where people were moving out of the province. Uh, and uh, you know, Calgary and Alberta have been actually advertising. It's been well publicized on Toronto subways and things like that about come to move to Calgary. Do we have too much of a concentration in Toronto and Vancouver, and is that causing some of the problem? Absolutely. Um, we need to spread that, uh, the, the amount of immigrants across the country. And, and Calgary was a, actually a big recipient based on the data that I've seen. So, but we need, we need to have that diversification. But I mean, as an immigrant, you only know, if you think of, if you ask them, you know, majority of people outside of Canada, name, name some cities, they're going to name Vancouver and they're going to name Toronto and, and that's it. So, um, I mean, we were advertising. I was, I was seeing, uh, we did a little bit of uh, our own version of Lover to List renovated and looked at other houses. And and a lot of the uh, how open houses were were filled with people from looking from Toronto with Zoom and coming out here. And and so I think that accelerated over the summer months. But um, I'm looking up, up my window right now and we've got a lot of snow and it's minus 15 and so maybe that that influx from Ontario <laughs> will slow in the winter. We'll slow month. in the winter time. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about some other real estate markets before we go uh, after the break to uh, more general conversation about the economy. Um, the office market has been decimated during uh, the pandemic, um, and I understand vacancy in Calgary is still uh, quite uh, quite extreme. What do you think about the the office market across the country? Um, well, in, in Calgary, it's it's not the best situation. Um, I think it's like thirty percent, um, and and it, it probably could get worse before it gets better. Here, um, there was the buyback tax that was implemented this week, and and so those buybacks are going to be slowed, and that may encourage more M and A. We've already seen a lot of mergers and acquisitions in Calgary, anyway. Nonetheless, so there's a lot less oil and gas companies, so they need less office space. Um, and and, and you know, taking that to other jurisdictions, the work from home is more of a hybrid. But um, is is that going to stay the course? Um, I think people are starting, from what I'm seeing from boots in the ground, people are starting to get tired of, of the work from home. Um, and and, and some, of the, some of the less 
uh, desirable situations with kids and, and not that the, the less desirable just interruptions and other things like that. And, and, uh, and so I, I think we'll see more of the, of the hybrid, you know, three days at the office, two days at home. So people still need that office space. And I think that'll continue to get better that the key is jobs growth and, and the jobs numbers were better this last, uh, last week that we saw. And, and that, that, that means more full-time workers, more people, the last, since the March of 2020, 87% of the jobs have come from the government sector. And, uh, and that's not good. That's not good for, for downtown vacancies. That's not good for businesses. And, and hopefully we will see a reversal of that. Like we saw in the last uh, uh, Stats Canada numbers. I want to come back to uh, some general uh, economic things uh, uh, after the break. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that uh, we've had this huge job growth. And at the same time, we're talking about potential recession. They seem a little bit, uh, you know, opposite, don't they? Absolutely. I mean, you've got 3.9% unemployment in the U.S. And and, and what's the number here? 5%? I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not too sure if all the U.S. a little bit more closely than Canada. Um, but it, nonetheless, there there is strong economic numbers from the job side of things. But um, they're worried about inflation, higher prices, and higher interest rates pushing forward uh, recessionary risks. And so could we see a recession with low unemployment numbers? Um, very, we could, absolutely. And that's a little bit of a unique situation. So typically, you, you, you start to see uh, a ri- rapid rise in unemployment and less spending. And, and, and so this is a little bit of a, of a outside the box type of scenario. And type of year that's for sure and you can see that with even like bonds selling off dramatically this year and that just hasn't happened uh, like again since the 1930s so we're in a very unique situation and and so yeah i think there are some recessionary risks but probably not as pronounced as what many people expect them to be tell me a little bit about this bond sell-off that you say hasn't happened since the 30s what actually happened so you have uh, bonds um, in, in like longer dated, mid to longer dated bonds sell off by as much as 15 to 18 percent. And and so typically when stocks sell off, bonds will go up in value and they offset it. So to, what an average investor has been told is to do a 60-40 portfolio. So 60 percent stocks and 40 percent bonds. So when the stocks sell off, your bonds will go up. And they'll mitigate the downside um, when markets correct. That didn't happen this year. It was the worst year for a for a sixty forty, I think, in history. The average balanced portfolio or sixty forty portfolio was down fifteen percent this year, sixteen percent, and uh, that's that's not very comforting for those who've been told that um, those bonds will offer that downside protection. So. Um, that's been across the board, and that's where a little bit of an of an of an of an anomaly in regards to uh, to those portfolios. So why would bonds sell off so dramatically? Because people believe interest rates will be higher long term for a long time. Yeah. So if you look at duration risk, so if you have a a ten year bond and interest rates go up by one percent, um, that bond could fall by. Um, anywhere from eight to 10% in value. And so they have a sensitivity. So the way you think about it is, is simplistically, if you bought a bond at 4% and interest rates go to 5%, no one's going to give you a hundred percent, a hundred cents in a dollar for that 4% bond, but they can go somewhere else and get 5%. So the value of that bond has to fall so that its yield goes to 5%. So we've had the biggest rate hikes um, in, in history in, in regards to the to such a short period of time. And so all of a sudden these bonds collapsed quite rapidly with higher interest rates. And lots the, of people say, well, short-term rates are going up long-term. They'll come back down again. What you're saying is the bond market isn't actually believing that completely. No, they're, they're taking a different stance than, um, than the equity markets, for example, um, where equity markets are thinking there'll be a Fed or a central bank pivot. What we mean by that is they're going to stop the rate hikes and eventually drop them back down again. Bond markets saying, hey, this might be a hike and hold for a while because inflation numbers aren't coming down yet. And so there's there is a dichotomy between the bond and stock markets. And and so as an investment professional, there's some some trades within that kind of of environment to take advantage of and some to be careful of. 
This sounds like a fascinating uh, quandary we're in. Do you believe the stock market? Do you believe the bond market? Do you believe the real estate market? Who knows? Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break and come back uh, in just two minutes with Martin Pelche about uh, the economy and how we got into this inflationary, uh, potential recessionary mess. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. Chatting tonight uh, about the economy, about markets, et cetera, with Martin Pelche. He is a senior portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. He posts on Bloomberg and the Financial Post. He writes for, uh, and, uh, you know, some of your uh, articles, sir, are really quite interesting. I, I've enjoyed following you. So thank you uh, for joining us and sharing us sharing with us some of your uh, your uh, your very intelligent and interesting uh, analyses and, and posts and articles. So we're talking about the stock market saying inflation is going to come down and interest rates are going to come down. You're saying the bond market is saying that uh, uh, that interest rates won't come down or won't come down um, as quickly as the equity market. And frankly, some people just sort of generally in the economy say, how did we get into this mess? Why Why do we have this high inflation? Did we do something wrong? Yeah, we did. And uh, so in, 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 I've got the the benefit of hindsight. So I'll, I'll qualify that <laughs> to begin with. But um, what happened was, is we did a lockdown uh, with COVID. And to be fair, um, if, if I was in the same shoes, probably would have done the same thing. It was quite scary at the time. And it created economic chaos. Um, not, nothing that we've seen since World War II, when you're shutting down the economy is due to a big conflict in that situation. And then what happened was, is that we opened it up again, and what we didn't adjust this the stimulus, the tremendous amount of stimulus that we used to offset the shutdowns. So monetary stimulus, we took rates to record low levels, and we uh, resumed money printing and buying of, of government bonds to quantitative easing at record uh, levels. That wasn't tapered. That wasn't slowed down. And we started to see all of a sudden you had the, the gates open and a lot of people were locked up and they said, I'm going to start spending because I had saved all this money during COVID. So I spent it on goods. You can see that on the goods uh, PMI pricing. We spent it on services. And everyone was we all, saying- We all went traveling this summer and the airports were clogged and we complained about the clogging. Yeah. So the YOLO, you only live once. Um, so we're getting all of these kind of acronyms now. And and so, and then you also had the fiscal spending. That was record amounts of deficit spending. Canada, the US, um, the, the amount of debt that was accumulated during this short period of time, the more debt was accumulated in two years than in 40 years. It was just astounding. And that wasn't slowed down. So you had the, all of a sudden you had the pedal to the metal with fiscal stimulus, a monetary stimulus, and economists everywhere um, and strategists, strategists were saying, we're going to get this inflation, these inflationary pressures from the surge in demand. At the same time, supply channels were interrupted. Um, um, the uh, uh, overall lack of investment in supply on metals and, and energy um, wasn't there. And so we had a huge tax on the system. And everyone was saying, hey, just take the brakes, like put the brakes on and take your foot off the off the pedal with monetary and fiscal stimulus, and they didn't. And so now you have a situation where um, the the central banks ha are trying to play catch up, and they're saying, okay, we made a mistake, we need to play catch up for what we didn't do, and that's that could create a whole bunch of troubles, and it, it already is in in certain areas of the market. But this didn't happen just in Canada. This happened. Very similarly uh, structured, uh, you know, fiscal and monetary policies in Canada, the United States, the UK, Europe, etc. No, yeah, and this is where it gets really interesting. Is um, at the same time you have an energy crisis unfolding in uh, in Europe um, with Putin taking advantage of of strategically taking advantage of Europe's reliance on Russian energy, and then you also have other areas like Japan. Um, economically that just didn't re get the same kind of economic boost, the same kind of, of turbocharged growth that you saw in uh, in North America. And so what they've done is they haven't increased interest rates at the same pace as the, as the Federal Reserve. 
which is the world reserve currency with the U.S. dollar. So the U.S. dollar has been rocketing lately against all major currencies and, and other currencies are, are devaluing. And so it's more than just interest rates. It's more than just fiscal spending. There's also currencies um, at play here. And uh, that makes it even more convoluted and difficult for investors. So I, I listened to this fascinating uh, interview of uh, President Biden um, back, I think it was, you know, 10 months ago or so, um, when uh, the big infrastructure uh, um, policies were being debated in the United States. And he said that uh, when he was the vice president after the Great Recession in the Obama administration, they got it wrong and they didn't spend enough money. And because of that, the recovery was slow and uh, it took too long and some places just never recovered uh, and that it helped companies, but it didn't help people. And they didn't want to get it wrong this time. Did 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 they get it wrong both times? They they did too little in 2009 and 10 and they did too much now. Yeah, I, I think they're doing too much now. Um, did they do too little before? Probably not. You know, there's an agenda there. Um, there's a there's a big climate change agenda, and and not that I'm disagreeing with climate change, but uh, COVID was used as a uh, COVID spending and emergency spending was used uh, to increase spending on climate change initiatives, good or bad, um, and and that's creating some of these inflationary pressures that we're seeing. Um, it's creating further pressures on energy insecurity, um, and 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 so insecurity in regards to lack of being. Uh, secure, uh, not being insecure, and 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 so looking at the infrastructure side of things, um, that that is creating a problem in in for the central bank, the Federal Reserve. They're going to have to keep hiking, and the more that the, you have this fiscal spending, I mean, here in Canada, uh, the last budget that came out uh, and, and talking about the thirty billion in initial spending. I mean, our debt servicing costs are going to actually soon be more than health total health transfers, and and so the governments are ignoring um, the the interest rate hikes as much as consumers are, but they can't ignore it for for forever, and it's going to have to play catch up. So you know, it's interesting. Um, you say that inflation is not going to come down too soon. Um, Friday we had. Uh, uh, education workers go on strike in Ontario. Um, Monday, uh, transit workers are going on strike. Uh, so, and and completely justifiably, uh, their their uh, wages have stayed stagnant as inflation's gone up by eight nine percent. So that they they've got a really good reason. But but if we have all these people demanding higher wages, isn't it just going to feed the cycle of uh, of greater government spending and more inflation and and the Bank of Canada is going to have to jack interest rates up even more. It's a vicious cycle. How do we get out of this? Wage and price <laughs> controls? Well, that, that's why. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm a believer in in higher wages. And we've been in a deflationary period of time uh, for the last 30 years because we had a readily supply of, of labor through baby boomers. And so we had a great amount of supply. Um, that means lower ability to cause higher wages. And, and so um, I, I think higher wages are probably not necessarily a bad thing, just like higher interest rates aren't necessarily a bad thing as long as asset prices come down again. So it's about finding that balance. But it is, uh, there is a potential for uh, the train to, to get derailed. And, 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 and what I mean by that is, is governments keep spending and keep spending and keep fueling this inflation when the central banks are, are trying their best to say, hey, look, you guys, everyone needs to, to, to stop. Cancel your holiday. Don't pay $500 a night for a room. Just don't do it. Um, <laughs> we're not. Uh, you go out for, I took my son out for the simple Vietnamese lunch and it was $45. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm sounding like my, my parents or my grandparents, maybe I'm at that age, but um, I mean, $45 for two. I mean, I used to get a steak dinner for that. And, and so maybe we need to, to slow things down a little bit. And if that happens, then, you know, it, it, you don't have to have the, the massive wage increases and then the prices and the wage increases and the prices, asset prices and costs of goods and services start to fall back down again. The wages have increased. Inflation uh, interest rates are a little bit higher and we live back in balance again. So it, it's not going to those extremes. So this pent up demand that was created by the pandemic 
and all this extra saving that uh, that was created because we were staying at home. You're saying we got to be more patient. We can't spend it all right away because if we do, it leads to inflation that is a challenge. Well, I hope you hope our we have the federal government listening to you <laughs> to this here because they're not getting that message, and consumers are. So I, I do think inflation will come will come down regards from the spending side. We've seen it already on goods. It's going to happen on services. Um, but in the meantime, do, do we have wage inflation rapidly get out of control? Um, and, and that's something that that's why central banks are, are trying their best to to bring it down, to bring inflation and bring asset prices and, and service inflation down as quickly as possible. But government certainly is not making that job any easier. So what do you think government should do? Uh, you know, we had the fiscal update where they did bring spending Sorry, they didn't bring spending down, but they didn't increase it as much as some people thought, and they uh, decreased it less than uh, than the, the and then they're going to have less of a deficit than uh, people thought. Uh, we had a different strategy in the UK that uh, Liz Truss started uh, or tried uh, that was a complete disaster, and she was out in forty five days. So this trickle down uh, economic strategy uh, doesn't seem to work. What's the strategy you think government should be following? Well, the the, the... It, the deficit would have been $10 billion smaller um, even if, if we didn't see this $30 billion in additional spending over, over six years. Um, you also have, um, you know, debt servicing costs. And, and then you have, if the economy does dip into recession, all of a sudden the revenues fall even more. And, and, and so the, the situation could get even worse. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to tell people not to spend you have to do it yourself. You have to lead by example. And that means cutting some, some costs and finding ways to, to cut. I mean, we're, we're out of this COVID lockdown crisis scenario. So why are we still spending as if there still is a mini crisis or still somewhat of a crisis? Um, and, and we have to put the brakes on. Um, that message is just not getting across to uh, to governments like like the Trudeau government or the Biden administration, it it has to and it will sooner than than later. Our debt servicing costs are going to go from uh, twenty and a half billion to uh, forty one billion dollars in short order. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, that additional twenty billion dollars in that boosts the the debt servicing costs to higher to more than the health transfer payments. So wouldn't it be better just to cut the spending, have let less deficits, reduce the debt servicing costs, and uh, and that means we can have more for healthcare. So they must be believing that uh, the electorate um, doesn't agree with you or doesn't won't won't put up with what you're suggesting. Uh, that's got to be what uh, they're uh, they're thinking, um, or at least the electorate that elects them. Uh, maybe not the electorate in 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 total, but the electorate that elects them. And so, therefore, by definition. If what they're going to do is not going to um, stem inflation, as you put it, uh, it's going to keep the inflation accelerator on. Um, by definition, doesn't the Bank of Canada and the Fed have to do more than they otherwise would do uh, to compensate for that? And so therefore, interest rates are going to go up by more than they otherwise would. And so therefore, asset prices are going to come down by more than they otherwise would. And so therefore, we end up having greater volatility than we otherwise would have. Amen. I mean, you just summed it up. It's, you know, you're getting the short-term gain and you're getting some really serious long-term pain and risk there. Um, the, the, the danger is, is and, and this is something that the, the Bank of Canada cannot go alongside uh, to support the federal government because if they do and they do not and they ignore what's happening south of the border with the Federal Reserve, our currency will get whacked. And it already has been. It's down to, well, it's, it was up the, the largest move in three years on Friday, um, but still at 74 cents. And oil's at $92 a barrel. Um, our currency should, in theory, be um, over 80 cents with oil prices where they're at, but they're not. And, and so that's quite disconcerting because if the Bank of Canada goes 50 again or 25 at the next meeting and the Fed goes 75 basis points, um, the currency is going to get whacked again. So th they're stuck. Uh, between a rock and a hard place, the uh, central banks are going to have to, the Bank of Canada is going to have to keep pace with the Fed. Fascinating conversation. We're going to take a break.
and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes. I'm going to ask uh, Martin Pelche, our guest. So given all this, where would you put your money today? Under a mattress or is there some place you can put it? Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Martin Pelche. He's a senior portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Council. Uh, he comments on Bloomberg on a regular basis. He writes in the Financial Post. Uh, I follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter, where I get uh, uh, copies of uh, all of his uh, his thoughts on a regular basis. Um, Martin, if people want to follow you, how should they best do that? So you can do so through the Financial Post, the Investment Pro section. You can also do it through LinkedIn or, or Twitter, um, or our website, um, which would be www.trivestwealth.com. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. So we've talked about how uh, governments are getting it wrong, that uh, the, the central banks got it wrong for a while, are now getting it right, though, the, though you're quibbling that the Bank of Canada should have gone up by 75 basis points rather than 50, and they're going to have to go up uh, more in December. Um, we've talked about how the real estate market may be set for a correction, but the stock market um, might have some opportunities. So let me ask you, if you're somebody with a little bit of money, some savings in an RSP or wherever, where would you put your money today? Just do you, your husband cash and keep it in your bank account? Uh, you're not earning much there, though a little bit more today than you might have in the past. What do you do with cash today? So it depends on what your goals and, and, and targets are. So if you want to maintain your lifestyle and you only need five or 6%, well, the environment is certainly a lot better now than it was Eight months ago, uh, GIC rates are over four and a half percent, and so that's certainly a, tr a trending in the right direction, and they probably will continue to go higher. Uh, for our clients in a conservative type of mandate, we're trying to get that five to seven percent. Uh, we're using structured notes, uh, which are an equity-linked uh, bond issued by Capital Markets, and we're getting uh, coupons anywhere from six to you know, 20%, depending on the risk mandate. Uh, corporate bonds are looking really interesting here. Uh, they sold off 15% and you're yielding 5.5%. We bought some utilities uh, companies with an option overlay. So that's yielding 8.5%. Having a little bit of energy for torque in your portfolio and inflation protection has also uh, been very beneficial to us. And then brought, buying in broader indexes on the TSX and uh, and the S and P five hundred staying away from uh, European markets and Japanese markets uh, has been very beneficial as well. So there's a lot of different places to put money to work and to generate some good returns to offset your higher cost of living at home. Martin Pelche, uh, thanks so much for joining us and uh, giving us your insight. You know, for what I'm uh, for what it's worth, where I am is I do think that uh, governments are in a in a precarious situation right now. Um, uh, they, they, they want to get elected again. And so therefore they've got to have policies and budgets that uh, attract uh, uh, what they think is their electorate, but, um, but they got problems that Martin has well identified where they're spending too much money. And, uh, and so therefore as, as citizens of our country, we need to lower our demands on government for more money. Uh, we need to know that they've got to become uh, far more, uh, fiscally prudent today than they have been in the past, uh, which uh, might be something that's sort of an oxymoron for governments, but, uh, but, but they need to be. Because if they're not, the central banks have got to combat that with higher interest rates, and that's going to lead to, I believe, more volatility and bigger problems uh, in uh, the real estate market for sure, but in other markets uh, as well. Uh, and I think that's going to be more damaging long term. And so uh, I think in addition to the things that uh, Martin is suggesting, I think we should be telling our elected representatives, uh, you know, be smarter uh, from a from a fiscal standpoint, lower your spending. Um, and we should all be contributing uh, to that to a certain extent by, as Martin has suggested, you know, maybe we stay home this uh, this Christmas and uh, and and pay down debt. Uh, because I think that's one of the best places you can put money today is paying down some of that debt. Because as interest rates go up, particularly if you've got uh, variable interest rate mortgages uh, that are going to be increasing, uh, decreasing that debt load, uh, which is, I think, Martin, one of the topics we haven't talked about, but sort of at an all time high uh, where we've got more debt, both personal, corporate and government than we've ever had before. And as interest rates go up, that's got to be a risk. Yeah, we're actually, if you put that all together, we're worse than Greece. So there's some, there's some astounding you know numbers there from a debt level. We're worse than Greece. Um, from a housing standpoint, you have areas like Hamilton that are more expensive than San Jose, California. 
So we've got some really uh, extreme situations here that we need to get under control. And I really like the way you summarize things about finding balance. And that means, you know, maybe uh, having some shorter term pain here, but a longer term will come out uh, well ahead. And so, you know, playing the long game is, is, is great advice. Um, but does a long game mean more than four years, which is the election cycle? <laughs> so <laughs> we have to try and tell them, hey, look, it, it, we're willing to, to make some sacrifices. Uh, you have to make those sacrifices alongside us. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everybody.